Okay, so, so I gave you a list of topics earlier, uh, and they were just sort of flat text. Uh, but they're very roughly organized into um, things that look 1D sequence analysis, or sorry, it's that's here. Um, and there are things that look like they're in 3D, so things that have to do with parts of structure and nucleic acid structure. Uh, and then there are things that look like networks. This is actually something that we do very little with. Most of, most of we're going to be doing um, sequence analysis and structure analysis. So there are a series of databases that you should know about. Um, and so some of these you, you'll, you'll learn about in great detail, and some of these you should just kind of know that this one exists. Um, there are some updates to, the, to this table that I've shown, and here they are. Mm. And uh, so, Everybody here should know what central dogma is, right? Anybody here has, doesn't know central dogma? Okay. So, um, so structure is really key to the central dogma. I mean, like I'm a structural biosomatist, so I'm a bit admittedly biased. Uh, but I do think that um, you can't think of of a cell as being some sort of digital machine because um, it's not even clear what's an error and what's maybe a driving force for evolution, right? Or what's sort of some, some way that the cell has of, um, of multiplexing or, or putting more data than, than you might expect in a single piece of DNA. So we talk a lot about structure in this class. Uh, let's see, mRNA secondary structure, for instance, is really important for translational efficiency. There are all sorts of things that happen when mRNA interacts with the ribosome. Uh, and of course, there's lots of RNAs that are involved in regulation. And the protein, the, the, the structure of the protein affects translation. For instance, there are things that happen co-translational, like there might be part, part of the secondary structure might start folding inside the ribosome before it's even uh, cleared the vestibule or got completed out of the exit tunnel, that is. Um, and that, that can affect how, how the protein folds and properties. Uh, we're gonna talk a bit about uh, nucleic acid structure. This is something I've done actually a lot of work on. Um, and you're going to learn about sort of this language that we have for describing uh, nucleic acids and the interactions that, that bases can have with each other. And it's not all Watson Crick, Watson Crick. We're going to talk about the genetic code, uh, the degeneracy, and things that, are, that this implies. And uh, we're going to talk about the protein structure and, and how it's uh, classified. And how, and most importantly, are these rocks, how it's predicted. <coughs> uh, yeah, well, we're going to talk about classification schemes of, of um, in terms of, of the, the various, the fold hierarchy and how, um, and, you know, the various levels fold uh, at the, from, from the small scale to large scale, how, how, how protein structure is classified. Uh, let's see, we're going to talk about primary structure and how, how, how the genome folds a little bit. And, and we're going to talk quite a bit um, about how it's aligned um, to, uh, to uh, DNA sequences um, by dynamic programming. Um, you're not actually going to have to code this up but you should understand how, what, what dynamic programming is and, and how it works. Uh, what's the difference between global and local alignment? Uh, Arne is gonna tell you all about uh, phylogenetics, how to assemble a phylogenetic tree, and um, what sort of applications this uh, phylogenetic tree has. Mm. Let's see, we're gonna talk a lot about fun uh, analyze, uh, predicting and analyzing function. Uh, we're talking about protein-protein interactions. Uh, we're gonna talk a bit about coevolution, how you calculate that. Actually, we're not gonna talk about docking this year, uh, but we will talk about things like gene order, domain fusions, things like that. Um, and um, Carson Dow will tell you a bit about experimental techniques, uh, especially having to do with transcriptomics. Okay, any questions about this? So 
So this is this usually um, we just say a little bit of uh, okay, so, um, so so a database is is a system for for organizing information and it uh, it, it has this concept of, of records and it enables querying and um, so so there's a term that we're going to be using um, so a table it's basically a list of records, and each record is in the same has has this, is the same form within a certain table. It's, it's all the records have the same format, um, and the, it, it, a record is basically a sequence of fields or column, uh, or columns, and each of these fields has a specified data type, um, and each of these can be set to some value. Right? You know, in some cases, it can be null. Uh, a query is basically um, a constraint, so you like you specify. Uh, what record you want, <laughs> and, um, and, it, and, and it, the database should, should give you a result. Uh, there's a thing called null discovery. That means um, searching for connections to data or performing additional computational steps. And so there, there, there are databases that, in addition to storing and retrieving data, allow you to uh, do, do some supporting calculations that, that, that give you something that wasn't there before. Uh, and we're going to do. I'm going to go through some figures so you can see more more clearly the concept of, of what these what these all mean. Um, so they can be relational or object oriented. The relation the relational ones are going to be very uh, very dominant. I mean, uh, the object oriented databases that, that's something more that you maybe when you code something up that you that you that you use this concept. Uh, I would say the dominant. Um, way to, make, to have a relational databases with this SQL. So the most popular one um, in some bioinformatics is called MySQL. And it's free and it's open and it's reliable, works perfectly uh, great. Um, let's see, relational databases are based on tables. I'm going to show you in a bit how, how these tables are connected. Uh, the queries can do the job of joining tables, but they can also be these so-called relationships. And these are hard-coded relationships between like ways tables depend on each other, um, and then this restricts how you can add or delete records. So, for instance, uh, here I'm showing you three tables, uh, and it's basically like like maybe something we would have here at Shoal, where it, 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 you have a students and you have courses, and then you have a student a, a table that connects the students to the courses, right? So here you have something that's called a primary key. And the primary key uh, is something that has to, you have to have, it's obligatory to have it, to, to have an entry in it. You can't have a null. Um, and it's obligatory that these be unique values, right? So, so, so if, if, I, if you give me the student number, I, I should only retrieve exactly one record. Um, one advantage of having a primary key is that it's very fast to search on the primary key. And you can make up uh, what's called binary tree. And you can learn uh, why binary trees uh, are very fast to search. Um, so this has student ID, and then this table of subject also has a, a primary key, and that's just like the subject ID, right? Uh, and then you have some sort of join table, and in this thing you go and insert a student and a subject, and so that way anytime you want to know uh, your course schedule, you just say, oh, I'm a student enrolled, such and such, and it'll say, okay, well, here are the, the subjects you're enrolled. Um, and again, you, you can make these relationships hard in, 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 in such that, for example, you can never create um, a, a row here if you don't have at least uh, one, one subject and one student. Um, these, these, these are columns. You can also call them fields. Right? And the, the, the value of a field in a certain record is just a value. And the record is, is a row. Questions so far? Yes. So this, this is a column, uh, which you can also call on the field, and it, it, it has to have a specified uh, data type. Right? So it could be integer, boolean, string. It could be an infinite length, length string, or it could be a string that's limited in, in length. But the point is that they all have the same. Okay, question in the back. Um, 
Uh, the primary key should itself be enough to uniquely identify the record. But you can have a multi-column multi primary key. Like, you, like for, for example, for this one, the primary key would not be this one, because obviously it's, it's repeated. But you can have um, a combination of student ID and subject ID. That could be your, your multi-field primary key. Is that your question? Any questions? This is the one thing that, the only thing that people miss on the quiz, so please ask me questions now. Uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, if you do bioinformatics, you're going to end up writing. <coughs> that's just bad. I mean, I mean, if you if you just, if, you just, if you were in an experimental lab and you just use just a user of bioinformatics, maybe not. But if you're working in a bioinformatics lab, this is one of the main ways of uh, disseminating your, your results. Um, and so this is an example that I coded up, which I haven't published yet. Um, and it's, it's a database that it basically, um, you give it a protein protein complex, like you just give it a PDB ID, let's say 1A22, and then you tell it, um, uh, and you, you tell it which chain you're tracking, which just chain, and you say, okay, chain A, you're tracking chain B, and then you ask it, okay, what happens when you take residue, let's say 34, from cysteine to, uh, I don't know, methionine, then it goes, it, what it does is it does a calculation of, of what the, what, how that changes the interaction between the two chains. And it also goes and finds some other, other, other protein structures from the PDB and repeats the same calculation on that, as long as these structures are, are similar enough. Uh, and then it gives you the results from all the calculations, and then the average value is more accurate than the, than the results of calculating this on one structure. So all those details uh, are kind of irrelevant. The, the point is that it's kind of an example of. of how a, a data, what, what, what sort of database you would have on the back end of a server like this. And so in this case, um, here's what the, what the, if the user comes later and says, okay, now I'm not the person that originally submitted this protein. Now I'm just some random user from the world that happens to be interested in the same protein. And I want to see, okay, what calculations have already been done on this. And I say, okay, type in my PDG, 2PCC. And oh, guess what? There's been a lot of calculations done on this. Uh, you have to also specify which chains are interacting, and it gives you the choice. Like if there's only two chains, it'll just give you that one choice. Uh, and then it tells you which, which mutations have been computed, right? It gives you all these results. Um, and so, so what the user's coming in with is a PDB ID, chain IDs, and this mutation. And then it goes into this other data database, which relates um, the different PDB IDs, right? It says, okay, this PDB ID, 1A22, it has also been, um, it's a similar mutation that's been computed in this other PDB called 1AXI, right? And there's some relationship between chains A and B and chain IDs in this other protein. They might be AD in both, but they might have different chain IDs in the other protein, right? And so, and also the, the resume numbering might change, right? So you can compare what, 14 to 12. Um, and the point is that you, you then push this down and you say, well, all I really care about is the result, right? Which you can fetch. There's a, there's a results table that's going to be. And then you have four results, right? And you can you can report that to your users. And, oh look, you know, there, this 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 calculation's been done. These four proteins and the results were kind of within 0.2 kilocalories per mole of each other. Uh, and I can you average these together and get a slightly more accurate result. Um, so again, that's that's what will be happening on the back end when you're retrieving your results from, from a server. Okay. Uh, so, Sean, um, <coughs> any, any questions about the last two slides? Okay, so Sean so uh, classifies biological databases uh, in this way. Uh, there's this so called primary databases, and these contain original data with minimal processing. And these are user submitted, the user being some scientist somewhere who did some experiment. Uh, and so examples of this might be the PDB, the protein data bank. So Chris Law refers to prior when people solve some structures, they submit the, the coordinates and make them available to the world. Uh, another example might be GenBank, right? Uh, and then there are secondary databases. And 
these are made by processing data from here, right? So, so the, the, this means that the, that they are going to be annotated either manually or by some computer algorithm, and they're being curated, meaning they're organized, uh, cataloged. You know, they've, they've embedded like crap has been thrown out and uh, good stuff has been kept. Um, and uh, so, how, how, do these have the same number of, re of records or entries as a primary database? No, you're saying no. Why not? The, which one should have more? The primary should have more. A lot more, right? You can't have more than the, the original source, right? And usually, these are much smaller, actually. Because, especially when you talk about manual annotation, there's no way a human being or even a hundred <coughs> human beings can keep, keep up with all the at least in terms of sequence and the sequences that are being submitted, even for constructions, there are just too many to keep track of. Um, so they're always going to be less. Uh, and then also you're throwing out, again, most of these have some way of filtering out stuff that they consider to be low quality data. So these are, these are typically much smaller. Then um, there's specialized databases. And these cater to a very small or comparatively small group of people, for example, that are databases for. Um, it's yellow guns, very databases for HIV, etc. Uh, and then um, I would kind of informally add a couple of categories that, that Sean didn't have. And I would say that the server database is its own category. And this means that, um, that there might be a server that does a calculation for you, but it might be a calculation that's kind of expensive. And so it makes sense to save the results and also make it available to other users, right? And so uh, I, this, this is the kind of server that I, uh, that I would usually make. Um, and then there are portals, right? So the portal is basically something that it doesn't have any data of its own, but it takes queries from the user and then connects lots of different databases and presents you the results in some coherent way. So Entrez is one example of this. Um, okay, so here's some primary uh, databases. Uh, Genbank, Emble, and DNA database, database, database of Japan. These, uh, they, these, all, these three databases are a club, a club of three members. Um, very lucky for this club. But anyway, it, it's, it, they, they, what they do is every, they, they, they all store original sequen uh, sequences and they all have the same data because they have an agreement to sync, sync, sync with each other frequently. I don't know how frequently, maybe daily. Maybe on some other theory. Um, and then there's a protein data bank, the PDB. Uh, and this, this, this has experimental 3D atomic uh, coordinates of, of proteins and nucleic acids and ligands. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the most common thing you can do is just download the coordinates in some, some format, PDB or MSIF. Uh, but it also has uh, quite a number of, of, um, of ways to connect to it in query. Like you can write these. You can write these scripts that send queries to PDB and return some result. Uh, any questions? Okay, so an example of secondary databases. Um, there's Tremble, and that's, this means it's short for translated embol. And so this contains sequences for only parts that are translated, um, and they're computer annotated from embol. Uh, and it also can has some link to mining, and um, oh, they, they, they port, they, they've gotten from Emil from, from the literature and from Cisco. Uh, there's protein information resources, um, and these are non redundant um, protein sequences that have been organized in some sort of evolutionary tree or uh, a phylogenetic tree, and, um, and then the Swiss plot, which is manually annotated and non redundant. That was very popular. Okay. Uh, there, uh, Uniproc combines these, these three databases, Trevor, Cisprop, and PIR. Uh, let's see. There's a PFAN and Block. So PFAN um, is a database of, of protein families. So it gives you multiple sequence alignments um, that have been manually curated. I mean, there, there's there's a there's a uh, algorithm that creates them, but, but they've been manually maintained. Um, and then blocks, it's very similar, except that it's restricted to the conserved 
regions of, of proteins, right? So it's, it's multiple sequence lineup, but they throw away all these regions where they can't get a good alignment where they should go. It's really regions. Um, Dolly, I think we're going to get into how to um, how Dolly works. It's a uh, an interesting system for for um, for comparing um, 3D structures even when the topology is different. Uh, and again, it's, 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 this is this guy. Then there's Omnim, online methylene inheritance in man. And so this is a database of diseases, genes, and alleles. Right. And this is very much manual in origin. Uh, let's see. So again, here's some examples of specialized databases. Uh, and I told you about uh, portals. Portals on trails, <laughs> which is a bad portal. Uh, and I told you I've worked on a couple of these. Like uh, some of them would be this was a database of, of morphs, right? So people would submit the same protein to different confirmations, and you would find some trajectory connecting them. Uh, and then I talked to you a little bit about this other server that I not yet published. Uh, yeah, so obviously, annotation is no way to guarantee that the annotation is correct, especially when it's in case of automated annotation, sometimes it's quite crappy. Um, sequencing errors are, are, are quite common, and they're some of these databases have a very high degree of redundancy. Uh, that's really not my, my area, but um, I think sometimes the faces are not called right. I think sometimes they, they yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not into the experiments at all, sorry. Um, so for those of you who end up making a, a server, uh, there are a few words of wisdom that I wish to impart. Maybe not so wise, but anyway, these are things that I've found important. Uh, first of all, keep it simple. Uh, don't ask people to do anything complicated. Every time you ask a submitter to do one thing, you lose 90% of it, right? So you already lost 90% just from asking them to do anything. Uh, but if you have them like uh, do anything that requires thinking, it's another you lose another nine percent in the end with zero users. Uh, the, I mean, the, the, the attention span of an internet user is like two seconds. So uh, let's see, use a job scheduler. So when I started this business, I just dumped the jobs onto this multi-core machine. I thought, well, if I need more more work, I'll just buy a bigger machine later. It, it was done because sometimes there are these jobs that take. I mean, maybe most jobs will take five minutes, but then there's some jobs that for some reason take five days, right? And so, and then you get a few of these and they just jam up your machine. So, so you use a scheduler. A scheduler is, is a, it's basically some sort of software that organizes jobs and and figures out which job should run first, how much time it should run for at the, at the maximum, and uh, how many cores it gets, how much memory it gets, how much disk space it gets, things like that. It makes your life a lot easier. We don't actually have a schedule at all, by the way, for one, but I should install them so you can start playing with it. Uh, user notification. Unless it's a trivial job that can be done in seconds, uh, have your server notify the users when the job is done. Uh, storage, buy, extra space. Uh, servers just fill up all the time. They just, it's kind of annoying to have to log in and you know, go in and delete log files and make more space. Mm. And also, if you're if you're doing anything having to do with drugs, and you might want to sell your server, then it's free. Consider privacy early on, because if you have a server that's constantly sending out queries to all sorts of public databases, then a pharma company can say, "Oh no, I don't want this information about what I'm working on leaking all over the world." So it's easier to think about that when you're just starting. But anyway, these are all basically very low-level technical details, I guess. Um, 